the Electoral Act might not be able to guarantee free, fair elections. So says the INEC chairman, Mahmoud Yakubu. And all is not well as two emerge as the new president general of the Ohanese Ndibo. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mariano Cohn. The chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, has stated that amending the Electoral Act without a commitment from stakeholders to do things differently cannot guarantee free, fair, and credible elections. Now, over the years, the calls for the amendment of the Electoral Act has been repeatedly made. However, today I ask, what do we do and what do we need to put in place to amend the act to ensure that our next elections are corruption free. Well, joining me are three gentlemen uh, to discuss this. Kunle Lawal is the executive director of the Electoral College Nigeria, and also joining us from Rivers Nigeria is Andy Akpotove. He is a social uh, analyst, and of course, we are being joined by Jide Ologun. He is a legal practitioner. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you, good evening. Great. So I'm going to start with you, Kunde, because you are of the Electoral College. Of course, people are wondering, is this the US? What is the Electoral College? But the, let's lay a foundation. Um, the Electoral Act has passed its second reading. And um, of course, gradually, it's going to be finally signed into law. Hopefully, we can now make it a proper act with all of the new additions that have come with it. But Let's start with what Professor Mahmoud Yakub is saying. He's saying, look, no matter what we do, this is a great thing that we're doing, but it does not ensure that we have credible elections. So I ask you, what is the one thing that we can do to not make, not just have this piece of document, but have free, fair, credible elections? Because this is what we have been desiring over the years. OK, if there's one thing we can actually do as a country to push for a difference in our election. One of the things that the Electoral Court Act will not cover presently, which it of course covers with, it doesn't also cover in the earlier Electoral Act, is the fact that campaign spending, there might be an actual limit for campaign spending, but in truth, what actually happens is that nobody can enforce what money is being spent within a campaign or not. As long as we do that, our campaigns will remain full of, you know, surgery, which is being sponsored by the high finance. And then also there will be ballot running, et cetera, et cetera, all going against the, the system, even if the system seems foolproof. Because we cannot control the amount of money in campaigns, our campaigns will, hide, will be rarely ideological. How do, we, how do you propose that we control this campaign money? Because I know that Sarah has... Uh, been on the case of political parties. I remember vividly what happened in 2019, uh, where Sarah severally called on political parties to make their party finances, um, you know, open to the public. They wanted to be able to probe how these monies were being used and how much money, if they had gone beyond and above the levels to which they're supposed to spend. So how do you propose? Because I'm sure that that issue is still in court. And you know how Sarah can be. They keep going to court on these issues. But literally sometimes these things are swept under the carpet. What do you propose be done in terms of managing these monies or following through to make sure that monies are not spent beyond the limit that's given uh, in the Electoral Act? Like already existed, there's a limit on campaign spending. You have a limit of about um, one billion for um, president, Mm -hmm. um, 100, 200 million for governor, about, um, let's go down to Senate, about 40 million, state house about 75 million, chairman, uh, 5 million, I think also, councillor, 1 million. The problem of why this, this, this cannot be managed is that there is no, no clear, clear place between the new electoral act or the mm -hmm. old one that empowers anyone to enforce such 
see. So there's no there's no law enforcement agency mandated to enforce this. It mm -hmm. just says when they have campaign funds for this should be this. And it doesn't there's no enforcement. So one of our problems, which drives us back to most of the problems within the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, is the enforcement. As long as there's nobody to enforce this thing, it will continue to be a charity. Huh. Interesting. Let me come to you, Andy. Uh, you are one of those people who have continuously screamed at the top of your voice about how elections should be conducted and, you know, all of the things that we've missed or um, the mistakes that we've made over the years. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, people have also said that the use of smart card readers, you know, the use of technology in our elections would help, you know, stem down some of the, you know, election fraud and malpractices that we've been experiencing. Um, how well do you think that we can regulate this knowing the kind of you know, roadblocks and the issues that we've even faced with card readers in the past elections that we've had? So, Miriam, first off, uh, let me quickly say that there's nothing that is novel, nothing that is exceptional or um, worth celebrating so much about what the uh, INEC chairman said. Um, so if you got um, an electoral reform today, um, it would take more than just the electoral reform to have a free, fair, and credible election. Um, there's no gain saying that because um, if you had all of the condiments to making a food, yeah, it mm -hmm. would take more than just the condiment to making the food really sweet and make it really very, you know, relishing to the pe persons who are going to eat it. That's exactly what you have just said. Mm -hmm. But you see, it is very important to have the condiment first. It is absolutely very important to have the condiments first. To so, in this case, so in this case, what um, are the condiments from, um, that we need, state. Andy? What are the condiments? Yeah, yeah, state. And what so are the condiments to making the food, yeah, um, which is not what we determine whether the food ends up being really very, you know, um, nice, tasty and all that, is the electoral reform. Let's have that first. That should not be the argument whether uh, as soon as we have it, um, people, uh, it will take more than just the electoral act to have a free, credible election. Even a child that is born yesterday knows that now. So there's nothing novel in what he has said exactly. The point exactly is that Nigerians are demanding an electoral law that makes it close to impossible for all of the quote-unquote nonsenses that happen today in our electoral system. I give a typical example in Marianne. If you were in Port Harcourt, for instance, and you were at water lines, you would see that before they uh, mounted the traffic lights there, people who came from Olo Basanjo axis just drove through the um, um, water line axis without any care to whether there was a traffic warden there or not. Those who were coming from Garrison just drove through it, through it anyhow. Those who were coming from Rumala just drove through it anyhow. But today, there is traffic light there. That regulates, it's not to say that it has reduced the nonsense that you see at water lines, but it has regulated the nonsense that we are seeing. So there's nothing exceptional about what the professor or what the INEC chairman has said. But what, Haven't said that, but, but what the INEC chairman was trying to say is that it goes beyond a piece of paper. It goes beyond the reforms. It, it goes as far as us making a choice to make these changes for real and not just saying, okay, well, we now have an election reform. Okay, this means that we're going to have free, fair, credible elections. He's saying that we all have to participate. All hands have to be on deck for this to work. Absolutely. We, nobody's saying no to that. But give us the reform first. Mary, have you asked yourself the question, why is it that the elites, the politicians, for this long, have been refusing to give us a reformed electoral law? And when we say reformed electoral law, we are saying that they should look at it holistically, everything including the spending and how to manage it, how to control it. Everything including the technology should be all incorporated into this electoral reform. You see, if we have been cooking this food for this long, Marianne, if you had been in the kitchen for three hours and you brought something that was close to you know, a noodles that you can take five minutes to make. People who eat it will look at you and say that you just wasted your time. If we have been okay. cooking this electoral reform 
and we bring it. And we do not have systems within it okay. that can check all of the um, 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 uh, all of the shortcomings that we have seen with the ones that we have had. If we do not have these systems within it, then it's not you. It's not used in the first place to right. have an electoral law. All right. Let but me. Let as I speak with you, my colleague, I just spoke about. Let me just hold hold that thought, yes, Andy. Please. Let me go to um, Mr. Gideon Logan. Mr. Logan, you are a, a, a lawyer, of course, and, and my next question is for you. One of the things that this new act or this reformed act seeks to um, change is strengthen legal framework for the elections. And we know how cases drag in court and how this has also distorted our electoral, uh, elect electoral calendar. Uh, and and so now we have certain elections that happen after or before you know every other state or federal elections. Um, do you see this happening, especially when we all know also that the 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 judiciary, as we speak, is not anything necessary that we could write home about. So will this in any way change something or strengthen our legal framework in this regard? You know, like, like, like it's been said, the amendment is seeking to touch on technology. And there was a test case recently in a two state where results were transferred directly to the portal. And that helps to eliminate the manipulations and the interference with results from the polling booths and the coalition centers. And again, we recall what happened in Kogi State mm -hmm. when Prince Abubakar Audu died before the conclusion of the election. The law is also seeking to, you know, touch on that, that, okay, if we have such a scenario, because that was the first time that was happening in the country and it became a big issue. In the mm -hmm. future, the INA can suspend that election perhaps for about 21 days, allow the party to come up with another candidate and proceed with the election. Then I've mentioned the, uh, okay, I, uh, my great brother has mentioned the case of pegging the expenditure mm. of contesting. And again, one other issue is you cannot, in, within the internal structure of the party, introduce extra requirement for candidacy, apart from <coughs> what the constitution has provided. Mm -hmm. Talking about the age, the education, qualifications, and things like that. And I think some, uh, some may be jittery in the sense that when these issues are streamlined, like Andy mentioned, then you have a good soup on the table. But it's going to work against those who are addicted to manipulating the system because globally, the expectation in democracy is that your election should be credible, mm -hmm. should be free and fair. And it takes a lot to achieve that. I mean, you recall what happened towards 2019 election when a governor, sitting governor for that matter, threatened that if foreign observers unduly interfere, they will go back to their countries and body back. So you can imagine the body language that expression presented to the world. Body language of desperation. So some of them may not be comfortable with laws that will simplify the electoral processes. Like as we speak now, there are some countries of the world that have adopted e-voting, even though some countries have dropped The vote buying also is another thing. I can tell you that the statement of the INEC uh, chairman it should not have been made. We know that is what we find in Nigeria. As a keen monitor uh, of the last election, almost all the electoral offenses were committed during the 2019 elections, how many of these corporates did we prosecute? So and that talks about the commitment to ensure that you implement your laws. But at least let's have these laws first. Then we move to the next level of how to implement. It's very important so that you don't leave any lacuna. But Barista, what is the position Barista on Logo, may, may I come deployment in? of... Uh, Barista Logo, may I come in here? Um, and that's why I posed my question initially. You're saying let's have these laws and then we can go... But we've had, we have so many laws in this country. We had laws while election malpractices were going on. We had laws in 2019 when all of the things that were happening in Lagos, in some parts of Lagos, uh, on the day of election was happening. I mean, what have we done with those laws that we've had before now? Even though we're going to strengthen those laws, 
what is the judiciary going to do on their part to make sure that there is no lacuna, there, is no, there are no loopholes that these so-called politicians can capitalize on? of government, the executive, the judiciary, and the legislative arm, and they all collaborate to govern the country. And I quite agree with you. If you have laws that are not implementing, oh dear, um... it's as bad as you don't have laws. And I also agree with you that we have so many laws in Nigeria. I recall there was an American president who said, we will reduce the number of laws we have, but implement the remaining laws. It's a big issue for us in Nigeria, really, on implementing our laws. On what can be done about that, it has to do with governance. Section 5 of the Nigerian Constitution 1999 as amended. He says that this can bring in all this, whether the abuse of office is within the executive arm, the judicial arm, or the legislative arm. We have to abolish corruption. But we are in a situation where some feel comfortable with corruption just to satisfy their, their ambitions and motives. So this is where we are. And the next question should be, whose responsibility is it to implement the laws? The government, of course. We can only be partakers in administering the justice. But when it talks to when, when we talk about implementing the laws, it is the business of the government. So when the government is ready to be sincere and sanitize the society, that are just hanging there, some of us are still asking what is happening to the Wadume, Wadume case now. What has happened to the NDDC case of Apabio of your mind? What is happening in the case of Minas? Several cases like that. And we have said it. When you identification, diligent prosecution, and a committed judiciary. And I think we still need that commitment. And that brings us back to what the chairman of INX said. If we are committed to the spirit of the laws we have, this nation will be upright. All right. I'm, I'm, that is my own position. Too. All right. Um, back to you, Kunle. You have you belong to something that's called the Electoral College. Where does it come in in the whole process? Because 2023 is just around the corner, and of course, people have started saying, oh, I have the mandate of my people. I think I'll be a better person to succeed uh, President Buhari. And, you know, it's also going on in states and federal constituencies. Where does the Electoral College come in here? Because it's not enough, again, to have a piece of paper or information that you know, just uh, people at a certain level understand. What about the guys at the grassroots? What about the guys who um, have not gotten enough voter education? Because I see that the INEC chairman is trying to emphasize that there has to be a commitment from all stakeholders, and those stakeholders include all of us. It's talking about the media. It's talking about security agencies. It's talking about INEC in itself. It's talking about CSOs. What, where does the Electoral College come in here? Okay, um, my job, our job within the Electoral College has mainly been what we call politicity. And what we refer to as politicity is political literacy of Nigerians. We first understand that it's most paramount. Before you even take any step in Nigeria, it is most paramount for <coughs> people to understand exactly what politics is. Now, in Nigeria, we have some hoax, hoaxes and myths within politics, which we have, which has become a mainstay. Like maybe a small party telling a big party telling you a vote for a small party mm -hmm. is a vote for the other party that is in opposition against them, which is not true because you still find those two big parties going ahead to hypocritically try to buy votes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we've noticed that uh, people within the Senate running for office in the Senate or running for legislative office, let me be clear, running for legislative office, come out and say, I will give you roads, I will do this, which is not within their jurisdiction, regardless of the constituency projects, which, of course, people in the legislative now now have, kidnapping the powers of the of the local government. So we spent a lot of time on education. The Electoral College has educated as of now over 7,000 people. We plan to move that number up to about 100,000 this year. We're also making moves towards the, the grassroots in ways in changing some of our program. Uh, literacy, politicacy programs into Hausa, and uh, where we should soon see a deal with a very big Hausa media station. And we already have some on radio stations going on around the world, which tend to 
tell people what these things are, what campaigns, what people can say during campaigns and what they can't say during campaigns. Mm -hmm. Most of all, to, uh, make sure Nigerians who I must, we must, we have all agreed, regardless of our educational levels in Nigeria, a lot of Nigerians are politically illiterate. So the key of the, within the electoral college is to change that narrative. And we're really doing a lot to make sure that where we've worked in that system. And we also are looking at a key point of even also, you know, pushing forward debates. We, 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 we organized the virtual Lagos East senatorial election by election debate. And, you know, at that thing, any candidate that was there will tell you, wasn't asked the average, uh, are you going to provide roads? Are you going to provide? No, we were talking about bills, how to lobby across things. And, you know, slowly we intend to change the narrative. It's a long okay. job, it's a long road, but we are dedicated and committed to making sure it's possible. Interesting. Back to you, Andy. Um, the commitment of stakeholders here again. Um, we talk on the radio every day, we talk on TV, we're analyzing about what people need to know, what people need to do. All hands being on deck, we never really get to hear about these government agencies who are saddled with the responsibility of making sure that people are educated enough to be ready, prepare them for elections, or know what to do, where to go, what questions to ask. And I'm talking about the NOA here. Instead, we have other private bodies doing the job of the NOA for them. And I know, Andy, that you are from a part of the country where, or you are in a part of the country where elections are always very heated. Uh, is there a foreseeable future where things would change for the best? And not just because we have a, piece of, a new piece of document, but that people have now become so aware that nobody can take them for a ride. Is there a foreseeable future like that? Is there anything, is that going to happen anytime soon? And how will that happen? Yeah, 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 Miriam. So why I'm I'm very hopeful is that we are going to have people who really have their heads on their shoulder get into political offices. If you have a very well fine tuned electoral law, um, because uh, the people who would who would be placed on these institutions that would enforce some of these things that make the system indeed really very good, are people who occupy elect elective positions. So for instance, this is what I mean. If you had a governor before, who became a governor because of his war chest or because of what we call structure, all of the militants that you know could help him um, stuff ballot boxes and all that. So when that person becomes a governor, is unable to use the institutions of state to enforce things that would be for the better of the society. Imagine if you now have somebody who indeed, because of the electoral law, is elected to become a governor. And is somebody who the people see that has capacity to be able to deliver. Once that person is elected, he will be able to push the institutions Okay. to do the things that will be for the good of the society. This is exactly the point that we are making. We are not saying that once this electoral law is giving us, that automatically is going to be that the country is going to be running, you okay. know, on autopilot, that um, we we'll then have good roads, we we'll then have great hospitals, okay. we we'll then have all of the nice cities of life. We're not saying that. But we are saying that the likelihood to then elect people who indeed have capacity and have knowledge to change society will be higher than what we have today. All right, Andy. Because what we have today, it's just a bunch of... Yes, please. We were out of time, so I'll quickly just pose my last question to Dr. Logan. Quickly, uh, Dr. Logan, I beg your pardon. Quickly, um, political parties have a major role to play in all of this. In fact, the onus is mo majorly on them. And of course, um, we the people make up these political parties and, um, you know, uh, how do we hope to help or... What do we, the people, do to make sure that political parties keep their part of the bargain? In other words, internal party politics can also affect the outcome of elections in general and also affect the will of the people. So if the internal party politics is already flawed, it means that the major general elections in itself will be totally flawed and the people might not necessarily want have the person that they would have wanted to vote, but it's the person that the party has decided to field because of one interest or the other? My global advice is that we allow righteousness. And what I mean by that is that we should exalt governance above politics. 
put those who can impact the nation positively forward. Because like we have revealed from the primary level, it is a candidate presented by the party that the general populace will come and vote for. So, and they say garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. So can we begin to identify those who are selfless, those who will serve the interests of the people and defend the spirit of democracy in the real sense of it? Right. And differentiate them from the greedy ones who are only interested in the huge amount of money they make from politics. All right, but what, we're having we're having a, a little problem with uh, Barstow Logo. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Andy Apotive. Thank you very much, Kunle Lawo, uh, Barstow Gideon Logo. Thank you all for being part of this conversation. Let's hope. Uh, that those who are watching this conversation and those who are um, listening to us, we would be uh, making better choices from now building up to 2023. Thank you, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. We'll take a short break. And when we return, we'll be talking about our Ndigo. Yes, the tussle for the leadership of Ohaneze and the way forward. Stay with us when we come back.